as a reminder, please keep your microphone muted unless speaking. Should I hear any inadvertent background noise, I will request that the member please mute uh, their microphones. Uh, I insert a document into the, to insert a document into the record, please have your staff email, email it to documents, ti at mail, uh, dot house dot gov. Welcome to today's hearing on examining workforce development and job creation in surface transportation construction. I want to thank the panel for being with us today and for your flexibility as we reschedule this hearing from its original date so that members could attend the memorial service for our longtime committee colleague and my friend, Don Young. Don devoted his life to serving his fellow Alaskans, serving 49 years in the House, including several as chair of this committee. His passion and breadth of experience will be greatly missed by all of us here uh, on this committee. The Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which was enacted last year, authorized more than $660 billion for the nation's roads, bridges, transit, railroads, uh, airports, ports, and other transportation infrastructure. A historic investment of this size will require a diverse, qualified construction workforce to ensure these projects are carried out on time and will be built to last. The construction trades offer fulfilling and high-paying careers supporting thousands of workers and their families. Yet too often barriers such as transportation costs, lack of access to training, and other support hindered the ability of women, minorities, and disadvantaged individuals to access jobs in the construction sector. According to the latest industry data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, women account for just 11% of the construction workforce, and African Americans account for only 6.3%. As we will hear today, a key effort in breaking down these barriers has been through the U.S. Department of Transportation's on-the-job training and, su and supportive services program. This program supports state training programs that offer recruitment skills, training, job placement, career counseling, and other services to help women, people of color, and others obtain quality careers in the construction industry. I'm especially interested in hearing from Ms. Tonya Smith, Director of North Carolina Transportation's Office of Civil Rights about her department's experience working with the OJTSS program and what outcomes they have been able to achieve. In addition to increasing workforce diversity, we must also ensure that federal dollars for construction projects flow through uh, to uh, throw straight through to the community. Last May, I was proud to stand with Secretary Buttigieg in front of DC's own Frederick Douglass Memorial Bridge to announce the reinstatement of DOT's local hiring initiative pilot program now committed by the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Through local hire, we can revitalize local communities and provide meaningful, good-paying jobs in construction to individuals living in low-income areas or areas with high unemployment. These initiatives are a good start, but Congress must continue to be vigilant to ensure that the historic investments in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act support a diverse workforce that is qualified to meet the demands of 21st century uh, and infrastructure. Thank you to each of the witnesses for being here today. I look forward to hearing each of your organizations support these goals and how Congress can continue to support good jobs in the surface trans transportation uh, construction industry. I now call on my good friend, the ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Davis, for an opening station statement. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I want to welcome all of our witnesses and 
uh, Ms. Smith, um, I, I hear that we may, all of us up here may have a mutual friend in your father. Yes. Is that the case? Uh, yes. Must, yeah. Okay. Oh, you're you're online. Um, I do want to say and rec I do want to recognize you uh, as uh, somebody who uh, has got a chance to grow up and, and see a lot more of our friend G.K. Butterfield than the rest of us has. And I'd love some good stories so I can harass him a little bit. Uh, he shares a, an office right by mine, and uh, G.K. is is somebody that. I've gotten to know on the House Administration Committee and just being able to serve with him uh, has, been a, has, has been a friendship that I cherish. And I want you to know how proud we are of him and we're proud of you for being here too. Uh, we're going to miss him in this house. Uh, he's true, he's a, a, a true statesman and please uh, take care of him when we can't anymore when he leaves. But I do wanna say, I'm glad we're talking about, I'm glad we're talking about uh, workforce issues. I'm glad we're talking to our witnesses uh, about recently approved transportation funding. And, you know, when it begins to go out, I I'm expecting there to be need for more skilled craftspeople. While many challenges exist for constructing our nation's core infrastructure, ensuring a readily available skilled craft workforce is our initial challenge. But it's not the only challenge that we face. And it's important to remember the context of this hearing and what we are discussing today. Earlier this month, we once again saw sky high inflation numbers, 8.5%. Inflation in March was the highest level in 40 years. The Biden administration's response to the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated the nation's supply chain crisis. Paying people to stay home has only made it harder to find skilled, trained workers. Add that to the soaring gas and diesel prices and construction costs having the largest year-over-year -year spike since 1970, and a, project simply, and a project simply costs more today than it did five months ago. So as this infrastructure money gets awarded, it is very important that this administration provides recipients with the flexibility needed, flexibility needed to ensure that they can be built in the most cost-effective way. One cost-effective way is to fully implement one federal decision. Since its enactment, this administration has dragged its feet in implementing this industry-changing legislation. For too long, worthy infrastructure projects have been needlessly delayed by our permitting system. Time is money, and in a world of skyrocketing inflation, further delay in implementing this law limits the total number of jobs, infrastructure, jobs that the infrastructure money creates. As the federal government begins to allocate funds for infrastructure projects, we must ensure our workforce is available and ready from the start so that the dollars can stretch further. Building trades and contractors are essential to our nation's economic growth, and I've long supported policies to support the construction workforce. I look forward to hearing from all of our witnesses about some of the challenges that exist in matching our workforce to our critical infrastructure needs. Again, Madam Chair and all our witnesses, thanks for being here today, and please, Ms. Smith, I look forward to hearing the stories about your dad that we can, uh, we can use before he leaves at the end of this year. Thank you and I yield back. Thank you very much, Ranking Member uh, Davis. I now recognize the chair of the full committee, Mr. DeFazio. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks again for this hearing. Thanks to the witnesses uh, for being here today, uh, physically and virtually. Um, you know, we have uh, tremendous opportunities uh, with the bipartisan infrastructure bill or the IIJA or whatever you want to label it. Uh, you know, a 400 billion in, uh, in uh, highway, major highway projects, bridges, 107 billion transit, uh, and 102 billion for rail. Um, as was noted, this will require uh, a tremendous uh, investment uh, in a, a workforce, a new workforce, and uh, reaching communities that haven't been reached uh, before uh, for all these new positions uh, in the construction uh, trades. Um, a lot of young people aren't aware that, uh, you know, of the tremendous opportunities that are out there, and we've got to reach out to them and recruit them into this. It's not uh, people with picks and shovels anymore. Uh, much uh, construction work is very sophisticated, computer-driven equipment, et cetera. Uh, we also uh, need to continue uh, to protect 
uh, Davis-Bacon, prevailing wage. Uh, we want people to get a fair wage uh, for their work. Uh, and be able to have a good uh, middle-class lifestyle, which is becoming more and more difficult in this nation. Um, so uh, that's uh, really key. Uh, I'm pleased to uh, welcome the executive director of the Oregon tradeswoman, uh, Kelly Kupkak, who is testifying on behalf of the National Task Force on Tradeswomen's Issues. Uh, Oregon, my home state, has been on the forefront of addressing historical underrepresentation of women minorities, disadvantaged individuals in the construction trades. Uh, just recently, Metro, the Metropolitan uh, Planning Organization in Portland, and its regional partners adopted the uh, Construction Career Pathways Regional Framework and signed the first of its kind Regional Workforce Equity Agreement. Uh, these coordinated efforts will help ensure delivery of infrastructure projects in Portland provide career opportunities for women minorities, and I look forward uh, to hearing how Congress can better support uh, these efforts and the administration as uh, we move forward. Um, and then uh, local transportation uh, agencies will now be able to require the percentage of the workforce uh, to build federally funded transportation projects comes from the local community. Uh, this authority commonly referred to as local hire was uh, previously only authorized through DOT pilot programs. It's now an established uh, permanent program. And I'm eager to hear from Director Liu of the Colorado Development Transportation Associate, Department of Transportation Data about uh, their experience working with developers, community colleges, local organizations to set and meet local hiring goals on their Central 70 uh, project. Colorado is just one place uh, where this has been done, reaching out into the surrounding communities and I look forward uh, with the passage of this bill to others. Uh, just to comment on a couple of issues raised by the uh, ranking member. Ah, we're seeing uh, uh, astronomical gasoline prices. Guess what? We're also seeing astronomical price gouging and profiteering by the oil and gas industry. I would invite the gentleman and others to join me on my windfall profits tax bill. The industry is going to use $22 billion of, as they call it, excess profits excess extra profits <laughs> to buy back stock, enriching only stockholders and boards of directors and CEOs and executives uh, while the American people are paying the bill. And oddly enough, that happens to be the amount of money we'll collect over the rest of the year from the federal gas tax, which are some are proposing to suspend. Let's go after them. It used to be illegal to buy back your own stock till Ronald Reagan. It's self-enrichment. And they're going to have record profits on top of the record Stock buybacks, oh, and by the way, they're going to pay record dividends. But oh, yeah, that's all the problem of, of Joe Biden. Joe Biden you know, created the, this, uh, the oil cartels. And then um, you know, we had a, held a hearing earlier today about shipping and uh, what's going on there with price gouging, uh, which is driving up the cost of every good that comes to the United States dramatically. The three largest shipping companies in the world made more money last year than over the last decade. And you, they're justifying that with COVID, emergencies, and all this. Uh, you know, a lot of this is price gouging driven by the largest corporations in the world who are all enjoying record profits at the expense of the American people. And I would invite my Republican colleagues and other Democrats to join me. At least let's take on the oil industry with a windfall profits tax and go after their price gouging. Uh, that would provide tremendous relief to the American people. With that, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Chair DeFazio. I would now like to welcome the witnesses on our panel. Ms. Shoshana Liu, Executive Director, Colorado Department of Transportation. Ms. Tanya Brown Smith, uh, Director of the Office of Civil Rights, North Carolina Department of Transportation. Mr. Brent Booker, Secretary Treasurer in North America's Building Trade Unions, uh, Ms. Kari uh, J. Karst, President BX Civil and Construction on behalf of the Associated General Contractors of America, uh, Ms. Kelly Kupchek, Executive Director, Oregon Trades Women on behalf of the National Task Force on Trades Women's Issues, Ms. April Ray, President and Chief Executive Officer, 
the Conference on Minority Transportation Officials. Thank you for being here today. I look forward to your testimony without objection. Our witnesses' full statement will be included into the record. Since your written statement has been made a part of the record, the subcommittee requests that you limit your oral testimony to five minutes. Ms. Ms. Liu, you may proceed. Good afternoon and thank you, Madam Chair. Um, members of, of the subcommittee and, and everyone in attendance today. My name is Shoshana Liu and I'm the Executive Director of the Colorado Department of Transportation. Thank you for inviting me here to testify and discuss CDOT's successful workforce development program as part of the Central 70 Project in Denver. The Central 70 Project that broke ground in 2018 is Colorado's largest infrastructure project ever undertaken by the state and comes in at a cost of about 1.2 billion. When we first started studying the I-70 corridor through the heart of Denver, it was essential that we understood the demographics of the community that would we, we would be working in so that we could meet their needs and keep them informed and make sure that they were part of the project. The Globeville and Elyria Swansea communities located adjacent to our most impactful construction activities are comprised of mostly lower income families, many of whom identify as Hispanic. We also learned that the unemployment rate was 10 times higher in this area than in other parts of the metropolitan area. While the project made dozens of commitments to meet the various needs of environmental justice communities, one solution we were able to come up with to address the issue of unemployment specifically was our workforce development program. The economic benefits of the Central 70 project are both significant and long lasting. And the project was anticipated to require about 4,000 positions from skilled craft workers to administrative support. In February 2016, CDOT received approval from the Federal Highway Administration to implement a local hiring preference for the Central 70 project. This approval was granted under a one-year program uh, called the Step 14 program for those familiar with the Federal Highway Administration statutes. CDOT is one of nine state transportation agencies across the US participating in this program, which allows requirements for contractors to hire a certain percentage of workforce from within specific geographic boundaries. In the case of Central 70, CDOT focused hiring targets on neighborhoods adjacent to the project developer, Hewitt Meridian Partners, known as KMP, during the estimated four and a half year project. KMP is required to hire 20% of its employees full-time from the local community. This program allowed us to hire residents from 13 zip codes that are touched by the project in one way or another. CDOT is also participating in the US Department of Transportation's official on the job training program or OJT, targeted to move women, minorities and disadvantaged individuals into journey level positions to help meet highway construction hiring needs and address the historical underrepresentation of these groups in highway construction skilled crafts. CDOT's contract with KMP requires 200,000 training hours to be provided to employees in the skilled crafts. In June of 2015, the Federal Highway Administration awarded CDOT $400,000 from its Ladders of Opportunity Initiative, OJT uh, pilot program to grant support to these efforts. Uh, these funds have now been used to establish a collective impact workforce program called Work Now. As of February 1st, 2021, only two and a half years into construction, the Central 70 project exceeded its workforce goal and had 600 local workers contribute 760,000 hours to the project. As of October, 2020, the Central 70 project's OJT goal of 200,000 hours was surpassed. The, com the combined partnerships also had a goal to have at least 50% of local hires be new to the industry and the project exceeded that goal with 75% of the hires being due to construction. Hewitt Meridian Partners continues to be a strong advocate for OJT and local workforce require requirements on the project as it helps to build more skilled workers that can continue to support and be a part of the construction industry. Indeed, this is extremely helpful as the construction industry writ large is suffering from a lack of workers, um, as many industries in this discipline are. So it's helped us not only on this project, but to build out the field. Overall, the Central 70 project has been setting a wonderful example for our transportation projects and what it means to make sure all voices can be heard from 
all community members could be sitting at the table during decision making, and that the job opportunities that come from major infrastructure investments can truly accrue to the neighborhoods that face the biggest impacts from projects. I thank you all for the opportunity to sh share the success of our program. Based on everything we have learned and witnessed through this program and this project, we are confident that OJT and workforce development will continue to strengthen the construction industry and help deliver more successful projects in the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Liu. Uh, I recognize Ms. Smith for three minutes, uh, for, for five minutes. Ranking Member Davis, Ranking Member Graves, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear today and speak about the importance of the Federal Highway Administrations and the NC Department of Transportation's on-the-job training and supportive services programs. Today, I will share our recommendations to protect and strengthen the critical workforce development components during this time where we are experiencing a shortage of skilled laborers. I am Tanya Smith, Director of the Office of Civil Rights for the North Carolina Department of Transportation. Thank you for inviting me to testify today on behalf of the state of North Carolina. According to Title 23 of the U.S. Code of Federal Regulations, the Federal Highway Administration mandates that state transportation agencies create and operate on-the-job training programs with our contractors on federal aid highway projects. The NCDOT's Workforce Development Initiative have two major objectives, to provide equal opportunity and access to all people and to produce a professional highway industry workforce that fulfills employer demands. We have several projects that cover almost every aspect of workforce development in the highway industry. In addition to targeting women and minorities, disadvantaged populations for OJT program participation in North Carolina include those with disabilities, justice involved, veterans, and anyone who lives in one of the state's most economically distressed tier one counties, including all eight North Carolina Native American tribes. Women are underrepresented in the private contractor labor force in all occupations surveyed. According to our most recent Federal Aid Highway Construction Contractors Annual EEO Workforce Report, the OJT program continues to be a vital public-private relationship that benefits all parties. The following are some of the OJT programs in North Carolina. Highway Construction Trade Academies for adults 18 and older. Advanced skills training in a variety of high-demand areas including training for a commercial driver's license for academy participants and graduates, career outreach and recruitment programs for middle school all the way through high school. However, there is still work to be done. The Highway Construction Workforce Partnership through the Federal Highway Administration is one example of a program that requires greater financing. This opportunity will allow us to work even closer with critical stakeholders and partners. Due to a lack of financing, North Carolina was one of a dozen states that were not awarded Highway Construction Workforce Partnership grant funds when the previous round of grantees were named. We were also disappointed that the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act did not contain new nor direct financing for workforce development. Only four program funds approved by the Fixing America Surface Transportation FAST Act are allowed to be used for workforce development by states under the new IIJA. The IIJA was enacted with the support of this committee and will go a long way toward ensuring a safe and efficient highway system. However, if we are to maximize the potential of the IIJA commitment, we must invest more in workforce development. We recommend a review of the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act in consideration of the reauthorization to determine if there are opportunities for amendments more focused on funding for highway construction and other transportation workforce and training programs. It is also important that OJT supportive services money be made available to train pre-release and incarcerated individuals. Unfortunately, without additional funding and flexibility of our programs, these and other workforce development programs will remain stagnant. 
finally, on behalf of NCDOT Secretary J. Eric Boyette, Deputy Secretary Ebony J. Pittman, the Board of Transportation, and the dedicated employees of the North Carolina Department of Transportation and our many partner organizations, I would like to express my gratitude to the members of the House Transportation and Infrastructure Subcommittee for this honor and opportunity to share our experiences and ideas regarding OJT supportive services, workforce development, and job creation in the highway construction industry. Thank you once more. I will gladly answer any inquiries you may have. Thank you very much uh, for, for your testimony, uh, Ms. Smith. Um, I now recognize uh, Mr. Booker uh, for five minutes. Good afternoon, Chair Norton, Ranking Member Davis, Chairman DeFazio, and distinguished members of this subcommittee. My name is Brent Booker, Secretary Treasurer of North America's Building Trades Unions. On behalf of the three million skilled craft construction professionals and 14 affiliated national and international unions that we represent across the United States and Canada, thank you for the opportunity to testify before this subcommittee. Building America's infrastructure is literally what our members do every day. Whether it's roads, bridges, transit, airports, water systems, energy infrastructure, public buildings, schools, or skyscrapers, our dedicated, highly skilled members build critical infrastructure in every corner of our great nation. The strength of the construction industry and individual job opportunities are directly tied to the strength of public policy advancing the building of public infrastructure. For years, we advocated for robust infrastructure investment to solidify and expand economic opportunities for workers and business and tackle tough public infrastructure challenges. The Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act will do just that. This bill will increase new job opportunities for construction workers, economic development opportunities for communities, new business opportunities for both large corporations and small business, and new training opportunities for those that seek a career in construction. The construction industry is among the most dangerous industries in the country. Workers perform difficult physical labor, often working on around heavy machinery and are regularly exposed to extreme temperatures, toxic substances, and difficult conditions. To guard against these inherent dangers, uphold, uphold public safety and promote first-rate work, workers must receive the highest quality education and training. For generations, NAB2 affiliated unions with our industry partners have trained the world's safest and most productive construction workforce through our gold standard registered apprenticeship system. These earn-as-you-learn joint labor management programs provide apprentices with on-the-job training from highly skilled journey-level workers and state-of-the-art classroom training. Each year, NAB2 and partner contractors invest almost $2 billion in the NAB2 training system, comprised of over 20,000 instructors at 1,600 training centers in almost every U.S. congressional district. 75% of all construction registered apprentices are trained in our system. Since 2017, an average of 75,000 new apprentices have been registered annually. In fact, if our system were a four-year degree granting institution, it would be the largest in the country. But unlike a college degree or even a community college, our programs offer a debt-free path to a fulfilling, lifelong, middle-class career. A worker has completed an NAB2 registered apprenticeship program earns on average earns an average annual wage of $60,000 and $300,000 more over the life of their career compared to non-registered apprenticeship participants. Workers are guaranteed good wages, health care, and retirement, retirement benefits during and after their apprenticeship. NAB2 programs also provide upskill training for tens of thousands of journey-level workers each year so they can continually improve their skill, allowing workers and contractors to remain competitive in a constantly evolving industry and marketplace. For our contractor partners, the benefits are substantial as well. By employing a highly skilled apprentice, our contractors see a return of up to $3 for every dollar invested in worker training. To allow for direct input and to consistently meet the current demands of the construction market, each program and training center is jointly administrated with an equal number of labor and contractor representatives. With infrastructure implementation, demand is going to increase. To help meet that demand, NAB2 continues expanding our apprenticeship readiness programs or ARPs, oftentimes called pre-apprenticeship programs. From 15 ARPs a decade ago to nearly 200 ARPs today, NAB2 has partnered with community organizations, construction contractors, and project owners to grow the pipeline of talented individuals who seek a construction career, particularly among communities underrepresented in the construction workforce. We have specifically utilized ARPs to increase retention and recruit more women, communities of color, Native Americans, veterans, and the justice involved. Since 2016, roughly 80% of the ARP graduates were people of color, and 20% were women. 
With written articulation agreements with registered apprenticeship programs, ARP graduates are placed directly into apprenticeship in the middle class, but we also want to keep them there throughout the duration of their apprenticeship training. With local higher provisions and the infrastructure law, there's a real opportunity to expand these programs across the country. To, continuing offering, to continue offering ladders of opportunity for those who wish to climb, climb them, our programs need steady job opportunities where apprentices can learn their skills in the field. Our programs only bring individuals in if there's a job for an apprentice. Continuity of employment is critical as an apprentice cannot complete their apprenticeship without employment opportunities over the three to five years required to complete their program. And it's why the infrastructure bill and public project funds are essential to training the next generation of construction workers. The magnitude and breadth of this investment will ensure that anyone from any background in any community can access a middle class construction career. Thank you for this opportunity to testify and I look forward to any questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Booker, for your testimony. Um, before our next witness provides testimony, I'd like to recognize Representative Johnson to say a few introductory words about Ms. Karst. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, yeah, this is a real pleasure for me. Uh, Ms. Karst is a fellow South Dakota and she's a friend. And I gotta be honest with you, everybody, she's a force of nature. Uh, she's done a heck of a job, uh, this BX uh, Civil and Construction Company. It's been around 60 years. It's been under her leadership for 30, and she has tremendously expanded its reach, a whole new suite uh, of services that they provide. It's been uh, really impressive growth. Her leadership has also been impressive, both in South Dakota and at the federal level. I'm not going to read your resume, but she's a former national outstanding chair of a small AGC chapter. She's a former past president of South Dakota AGC. And I would just note this by way of closing, Madam Chair. We talk a lot about rural development, about keeping rural America strong in this room and throughout Congress. And Dale Rapids is a town of about 4,000. And at the peak of the construction season, Ms. Karst and her team employ about 150 people. And they're doing projects, some really big projects across the region. And to me, if we want to look at how do we grow rural America, how do we grow the workforce in this incredibly important construction industry, we're going to need innovators, we're going to need leadership, and boy, do I have one for you. Thanks for being here. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Johnson. Uh, now I recognize Ms. Cost for five minutes. Thank you, Congressman Johnson. Uh, thank you, Chair Norton, Ranking Member Davis, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for allowing me to testify, testify on this vitally important topic. My name, as Dusty said, is Carrie Karst. I am the president of BX Civil and Construction in South Dakota and an active member of the AGC of, of America. AGC is the leading association in the construction industry representing 27,000 firms, union and open shop contractors, many of which are small businesses. BX Civil and Construction began its history as a subcontractor on the interstate highway system, performing seating, fencing, guardrail, permanent signing for highway projects. I purchased the company in 1992 and became certified as a woman-owned disadvantaged business enterprise. We have successfully grown and added capabilities like concrete paving and bridge repair. We now perform as a prime contractor or general contractor, as well as a subcontractor on highway construction and infrastructure projects. Because of our growth, I graduated from the Disadvantaged Business Enterprise Program last fall. In my testimony today, I will discuss current issues facing the construction industry, particularly as it relates to the workforce. The Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act provides market opportunities for construction companies like mine and assures sustainable, good-paying jobs for our employees. As unemployment once again hits record lows in my state and other states around me, contractors are having an exceedingly hard time to find workers that we need. In South Dakota, we collaborate with our South Dakota DOT to utilize grant funding to develop a CDL training program that allows us to use joint marketing to recruit new drivers to our industry and to upskill our existing workforce. We provide the required classroom training and train our members to document and provide skills training for our employees. The AGC of South Dakota while small, has three federally registered apprenticeship programs that allow our workers to achieve journey level certification in carpentry, concrete finishing, and heavy equipment operation. Our South Dakota chapters also focus heavily on attracting the next generation of construction workers through construction career camps, which focus on exposing students 
to the opportunities in, in our industry during their middle and high school years. I am pleased to let you know that South Dakota is not an anomaly. AGC chapters across the country are providing innovative workforce programs to their local members. Unfortunately, the administration's efforts as it relates to workforce will neither attract nor prepare workers for a long-term career in construction. They attempt to treat symptoms, not causes of workforce shortages. I ask that Congress and the administration provide flexibility as they implement this law to help ensure that projects can be completed efficiently and in a timely manner. Construction companies are reporting shortages and increased prices on manufactured steel, steel and plastic piping, paint, concrete materials, and many other items. Cost increases ranged from 15% to doubling or tripling on some items. Construction firms are forced to pass along the rising materials prices in order to remain viable as companies. Lead times for these materials have dramatically increased. As a result, crucial infrastructure projects across the country run the risk of delay. The inability to predict the, avail and the availability and, of, and price of materials and to foresee things like the Russian invasion, spiking oil prices, and soaring inflation are devastating to many contractors. Many contracts do not have price adjustment clauses. These impacts are especially devastated to, devastating to small DBE construction firms that lack the resources to absorb these unexpected costs. A recent FHWA guidance memo highlighting that states should focus exclusively on maintenance and repair work on existing roadways is confusing and concerning. In the states where I work, there are a broad range of needs that our DOTs work hard to meet. Maintenance of existing roads and new roads may be a rural community's only opportunity to attract business and thereby assure its future. More developed cities like Sioux Falls certainly have the need for repair and maintenance, but also have the need for additional expansion space to accommodate the residential and commercial growth. Making blanket guidance in favor of repair and maintenance over expansion is restricting our opportunity for growth, and this restriction will directly affect the ability of a disadvantaged firm to grow. Our nation's interstate system was built and designed over 50 years ago. It's past time that states modernize them to meet the current needs of the populations they serve, and to do so, they need the flexibility to add new capacity. I want to express our deep concern regarding recent efforts to suspend the federal gas tax in the name of economic relief. We believe this effort is misguided and could, could act to undermine the recently enacted infrastructure law. I thank the subcommittee for the opportunity to testify today. I appreciate your continued efforts to improve our nation's infrastructure and policies that create good paying jobs in America. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, uh, Ms. Karst. I now recognize Ms. Kupchak of four or five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, Ranking Member Davis, Ranking Member Graves, and esteemed subcommittee members for providing me on behalf of Oregon Tradeswomen and the National Task Force on Tradeswomen Issues for this opportunity to speak to workforce development and job creation and surface transportation construction. I'd also like to give special thanks to Chairman Fafazio, Oregon's own, for his leadership and commitment, not only to Oregonians, but to all Americans and having access to good careers while rebuilding our nation and inviting me here today. And thank you to the committee members for investing in America's infrastructure and our workforce. We believe that the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act will not only improve our nation's infrastructure, but in doing so, change lives for so many. Here in Oregon, I have the privilege to serve as the executive director of Oregon Tradeswomen, a nonprofit headquartered in Portland, Oregon. Since 1989, we have been working to increase the number of women entering and succeeding in the skilled trades in construction, transportation, and other blue collar professions. We provide pre-apprenticeship training, support services, and work in partnership with industry to ensure that their workforce needs are met with skilled, qualified workers, and we promote the retention and leadership of tradeswomen. Oregon Tradeswomen is a founding member of the National Task Force on Tradeswomen Issues, a national coalition working to advance economic opportunities in blue collar careers for women. 
Through this historic investment into our nation's infrastructure, we have the opportunity not only to expand our nation's workforce through these career opportunities, but to ensure that our nation's job seekers who have long been underrepresented in the skilled trades to benefit from these investments. Women have been underrepresented, not because of lack of interest or lack of talent or ability, but because of outdated myths, misunderstandings, and sadly still, discrimination which continue to create occupational segregation, resulting in women largely clustered into low wage occupations. Having access to dynamic and good paying jobs in our infrastructure economy can not only shift what our labor force looks like, but it can impact economic security for women and their families. But without intentional efforts and strong public policy and investment to improve and support access to such publicly funded jobs, women, particularly women of color, are unlikely to benefit from these historic levels of investment. Poverty rates for women in the United States remain at historically elevated levels. In fact, in our nation, one in seven households is headed by a woman who's living in poverty. Access to high wage careers such as those in the highway construction and transportation sectors are critical for women's economic advancement while meeting our nation's labor shortages. Public policy, especially the design and delivery of infrastructure investments, impacts tradeswomen in the work we do every day, from the local level to the state and federal rules. Such policies can and do enhance women's economic security, support our employers, and enhance economic growth. Through investing in and providing quality training to women through pre-apprenticeship and registered apprenticeship in these fields, fields that provide good wages, benefits, are also an opportunity for a lifelong career that can and do change people's lives. Real people like Lori, a woman who came to our free apprenticeship readiness program at Oregon Trace Women, using her last few dollars to take the bus to our training facility to get help into getting into a skilled trades career after recently becoming sober. That was over a decade ago where she has worked hard in the field as a union laborer and worked her way through a tough job, turning it into a career. She now owns a home, is active in volunteering in our community, is a leader in the industry in her union and serves as a mentor to other tradeswomen. Or Leslie, who after being raised by a single father, struggled to make ends meet with the minimum wages in her small rural town while she was working to provide for her sick dad and disabled brother. She heard about our program and now she's making a living wage as a union trades worker and she now can believe in a future that has economic security. Both of these women and many others benefited directly from the federal OJT supportive services program. We know that when women have access to high wage, high skilled careers, that our nation will benefit from these returns on investment through moving women and their families out of poverty into the middle class where they have economic security for themselves and their families and can contribute to the local economy. The Federal Highway Administration's OJT Supportive Services Program provides a mechanism to ensure that quality training is available, support services that will help job seekers get the skills they need to have a lifelong career. Infra infrastructure and- Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Kupchak. Can you summarize your past your five minutes? Thank you, Madam, and my apologies for going over. Thank you for allowing us to submit our rec uh, written recommendations, and thank you for this committee for uh, creating a bold and, and broad infrastructure bill that will help our nation's workers. Thank you, Ms. Kupchak. Uh, finally, Ms. Ray, you are recognized for five minutes. Good afternoon, Chair Norton and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the invitation to speak to you today. My name is April Rye, and I am the National President and CEO of the Conference of Minority Transportation Officials, also known as COMTO. COMTO was established in 1971. We just marked our 50-year anniversary of our founding last year and reaffirmed our mission to ensure opportunities and maximum participation in the transportation industry for minorities, veterans, persons with disabilities, and certified minority, women, and disadvantaged business enterprises. We have 35 chapters across North America, 34 in the US and one representing Toronto and the surrounding region. Our 3,000 members include individual transportation professionals, 
transportation agencies, private sector companies, and educational institutions, including historically black colleges and universities. This translates into tens of thousands of Compton constituents. We serve as the voice for equity in transportation, providing support to transportation agencies in achieving their EDI goals, supporting the leadership development of transportation professionals through leadership training, and also very relevant to today's topic, Comptel provides scholarship and paid internship opportunities across the nation to attract the next generation of transportation professionals and leadership to this great industry. Two key initiatives that Comptel has to support the strengthening of a transportation workforce pipeline include our city internship program. Through this program, paid internship opportunities are provided to minority students around the country connecting them to real-world professional and practical experience in the transportation industry. We're currently working to secure funding to expand this program to focus on recruiting for apprenticeship programs and skilled labor jobs in transportation. In addition, we have a national scholarship program. We annually award multiple academic scholarships to minority graduate and undergraduate students from across the country. Coupled with the efforts of our 35 chapters, millions of dollars have been awarded to deserving students pursuing careers in STEM and transportation professions. At Compto, we believe the leadership of a massive industry like transportation, who has the responsibility of being the great connector, should reflect the complex mosaic of those they serve. To that end, we must be intentional about attracting professionals from diverse backgrounds to this industry. In a recent visit to Morgan State University, one of two HBCU-led universities in the U.S. Department of Transportation's University Co Transportation Centers, Secretary Buttigieg made a comment that I truly agree with. He said, as a country, we cannot afford to leave any talent on the table. We have to ensure that transportation is an engine of equity. To that end, Comto supports and recommends expansion of local and communities of need hiring preferences that strengthen our communities by helping to create good local jobs, increasing opportunities and greater equity for people of color, women, veterans, and others facing barriers to employment. We also recommend public and private partnerships that focus on workforce development programs and attracting youth to the transportation industry with paid internships and apprenticeship opportunities. As Chair Norton stated, the bipartisan infrastructure law will generate historic investments into construction and maintenance of U.S. roads, bridges, waterways, airports, et cetera. But without enough workers, efforts to strengthen roads and public transportation will be set back, and service delivery to communities will be delayed, which we all know will disproportionately impact communities of color. We believe jobs is the operative word in IIJA. Both Congress and the administration will have to be innovative and take aggressive action in the coming months to support programs and initiatives around workforce development, recruitment, and training. We are hopeful that this will include programs for emerging transportation professionals, STEM construction curricula, especially in trade high schools, vocational schools, and HBCUs. These programs will include the opportunity, hopefully, for public and private partnerships to advance overall goals and outreach. Research has shown the many benefits of a diverse and inclusive workforce, including innovation, new perspectives, higher profits, and ironically, the domino effect of increased abilities to recruiting a diverse talent pool. I wanna conclude by offering the Conference of Minority Transportation Officials as a resource to this subcommittee and its members as you move forward to consider legislative activity to address the needs of the workforce of the future. Thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Ms. Rye. Uh, I recognize uh, Chair DeFazio uh, for his five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Ms. Rye, um, what, you know, we're, we're talking about new entrants into the workforce, and in particular, we want to be looking at youth. What is sort of, I mean, I know it varies by region, but I mean, your average uh, unemployment rate among young uh, high school, post-high school age people of color, I think it's quite high, is it not? You can? It is, and I don't have the exact number in front of me, but it is disproportionately high. Right. So we need to let them know what's available and uh, give them opportunities to be exposed to careers in this industry um, and make those opportunities paid opportunities through internship and apprenticeship programs so they can know what the possibilities are. Right. I was visiting just 
anecdotally, uh, LAX with the major new construction project, and they engaged in this sort of effort given the area around the airport is generally low income, a lot of minority, and they in, had tremendous success in recruitment and getting a young workforce who will now probably stay in the workforce. So I congratulate you uh, on your efforts. Uh, uh, to uh, Ms. Karst, um, you say here that um, prices on manufactured steel and plastic piping, paint, concrete, uh, range from 15 to a doubling or tripling on some items like manufactured steel. What accounts for that? Oh, your mic, your mic, your mic. I don't know if I can answer why those materials prices have gone up. I think a lot of it really has to do with what's going on in the world today, um, the supply chain issues associated with the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, I think my, my reason for talking about it is that contractors are dealing with this as, as part of their stress. Right, and you uh, have a, a, a group, uh, I guess through AGC, has petitioned uh, the uh, Biden administration to make clear that American Rescue Plan money by state and local governments uh, could be used to help mitigate uh, the cost of supply chain delays and the effects having on project costs? Yeah, I think what we're, what we're asking for is we're as asking for, um, for you to give us flexibility at the state level to make decisions that make sense for our state. Okay. So if that has, happens to do with some of the supply chain issues, Absolutely, give our states the flexibility. We have good relationships with our state DOTs, and we want to be able to use those relationships to do what's right for the constituency there. Right. Uh, I think the ranking member, though, pointed to that bill as a major ca cause of inflation. And, of course, you just pointed out that the, the inflation in the cost of construction materials has nothing to do with the passage of the rescue plan, but now we want to apply rescue plan money to help mitigate those impacts. Uh, so I, I just find some things here a little bit contradictory. Um, and just uh, one more question for you. Um, you know, you, you said that, um, you made a point, it was my position, uh, it still is, that some states are doing a miserable job in maintaining their infrastructure. Uh, let's see, the president visited the day after a bridge collapse in Pittsburgh. Uh, Pennsylvania has uh, huge bridge problems, as do many, many states. 42,000 bridges on the national highway system need substantial repair or total replacement. Um, some states, perhaps yours, uh, are doing very well on that. Uh, but the idea of Fix It First was look at uh, that and deal with it, maintain and rebuild in a resilient way our existing infrastructure, not exactly the way it stands now. It could be increased capacity. It certainly would be more resilient to severe weather events and other things that are happening. Uh, and, and also, uh, in major urban areas, you don't have any of those, uh, but to look at innovative solutions to deal with congestion, you aren't going to be building a hell of a lot more highway miles through our major cities. Just uh, there's no place to put them. Uh, and that's what Fix It First was. Uh, it was, and it is only guidance on the part of the administration. So I, I'm a bit puzzled at the uh, objection to this sort of guidance from the administration. You, you can briefly answer that because I have to ask another question to the other witnesses. So you want me to answer that, or well, very quickly. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll, again, we're we're focusing on flexibility. We don't want to have um, edicts that come down. Um, that tell us exactly how to do things, that each community should know exactly what their situation is and whether or not that makes sense for their community. Um, really, we believe that our states are actually already fixing it first. 80% of the work is in repair and maintenance of existing infrastructure. Well, um, I'm about to run out of time, unfortunately, because uh, I did uh, want to ask uh, further questions. But um, with that, Madam Chair, I would yield back my last one second. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair DeFazio. Uh, I now recognize Ranking Member Davis for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you again to the witnesses. Ms. Carson, let me start with you. Uh, I really appreciate you raising the importance of one federal decision. It's an idea that I've been proud to champion, and I remain frustrated, as I said in my opening statement, that this administration is dragging its feet in implementing the common sense changes to our regulatory process. Can you tell the committee how this policy will help build more roads and more bridges? You know, in my opinion, as you look at different states, 
Um, the way the states administer money is uh, many times to other entities, whether it's the counties or townships and that kind of thing. These counties and townships don't understand the red tape that they have to go through, get very frustrated when they have a farm to road um, bridge structure um, that is, is obsolete and can't be used anymore. And when, they, when it takes them six years to get that approved, they look to that as the state's problem, and when in reality, um, it's really decisions that could be corrected through one federal decision. You think it should be expanded to other areas? Absolutely. Yeah, I believe that you know the efficiencies of one federal de de decision could be used in many places in, in our infrastructure funding. Yeah, I mean, we're not here saying, you know, build a road, destroy the environment, right? I mean, we just want the regulatory process to have an end date. And I remember sitting in this room a few years ago when we passed a water bill that you know, when we figured out that the average Corps of Engineers project took about 15 years to get through the regulatory process. I mean, I think it's wrong. How about you? I absolutely think it's wrong. People are hearing about these needed projects um, and they're seeing that it takes too long to get them done. Well, it does. It, it certainly does. And that means it keeps our men and women in the building trades from being able to be employed on a job site, right? Absolutely. Well, I, that leads me to you, Mr. Booker. I appreciated the building trades pass support for the one federal decision bill. Um, would you like to add anything else regarding one federal decision on how it delays, how its delays and implementation may impact your members' ability to be on the work site? Yeah, I mean, we, you, you, as you just mentioned, we've uh, we've been on the past, you know, uh, on the record supporting your legislation, and thank you for your leadership on that. And you know, we feel as you feel that you need predictability. You need predictability throughout the construction process at the beginning of the permitting process. We're all for regulation. We're all for you know doing it the right way, but let's streamline and do it the way that your your legislation is put forward. And it's not a matter of is it going to adversely affect building trades members versus non-building trades members. If a project's not permitted, it's going to affect anybody who's going to work on that. So, you know, that's why we've advocated with you on behalf of, you know, trying to streamline these uh, these processes, and, and we're in support of that, and think that uh, that's that's the right way to go. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the support uh, of of that uh, that particular provision. And now we just hope that the administration's able to implement this provision in a way that we had intended it uh, when this was debated numerous times here in this committee. Uh, Ms. Karsk, if I could come back to you, your company has, uh, what you said, grown out of the Women and Disadvantaged Business Program. Can you speak to AGC's efforts to help companies navigate this transition? Um, to AGC's efforts, uh, really, I've been involved in AGC, really, my entire career in the construction industry. Um, it is really uh, the association that has given me the opportunity to learn how to run a really good business and how to grow my business through having mentor relationships with other people in the industry. Um, AGC does a ton to train um, its members and our workforce. Uh, it is the, the experiences in AGC um, that have allowed me to figure out the best way to grow the business and make decisions based on where I was headed and with the way the company was growing and how it fit within the disadvantaged business program. I think as I said at the beginning, I have transitioned from being less of a subcontractor and more of a prime contractor. And it's through the resources and education that AGC um, gives its members, advocates for on behalf of its members, that has allowed me to grow. Well, I appreciate hearing that. I had the chance to visit our local Illinois AGC chapter when I was uh, back in Illinois over the last week and a half. So with that, I really appreciate your responses. And Madam Chair, I know you're surprised, but I'm actually going to yield you back some time. <laughs> Thank you, Brad. We'll see, we'll see what we can do with it. Uh, uh, I recognize myself for five minutes. Ms. Rye, uh, I want to first offer my congratulations on the 50th anniversary of Compto's founding that is really an important milestone. Your testimony notes that despite changes in the racial and gender demographics of the overall workforce, uh, women and minorities are still underrepresented and underutilized in the transportation construction industry. Now, Congress has just enacted a landmark infrastructure uh, legislation to bipartisan legislation that includes provisions as noted in your testimony to invest in the transportation workforce. What can Congress do to prioritize increasing participation of women and minorities 
in transportation construction workforce, both in overseeing the implementation of infrastructure law and beyond. Thank you, Chair Thornton. I do believe that with regard to the monies that are available uh, at the DOT for um, this work, it is extremely competitive. The monies that are specifically allocated towards workforce development um, and capacity building. So we need to look at appropriating more dollars to this work. Um, we look to work with state DOTs and also um, private transportation organizations and construction firms in this work, but to assist in the capacity and the outreach efforts to let folks know what is available, um, we have to have public and private partnerships. Uh, we're also looking to work with the HBCUs that are part of the UTC program um, to utilize that as a pipeline to attract the next generation to the transportation industry. Um, we're also looking to see if we can do better with definitions around what are historically underutilized businesses, hubs, those that are minority-owned, women-owned, um, and disadvantaged businesses at the federal level um, so that funding can be appropriated um, in a way that truly benefits the communities that need it the most. Well, what benefits and impacts are employees seeing uh, when they invest uh, in efforts to diversify their workforce? I'm sorry, of employers seeing when they invest in efforts to diversify their workforce? I think we can all agree that when we support individuals um, as professionals, we support families, and families make better communities, better regions, and uh, a stronger nation. So it helps us all when we invest money in these professionals and make sure that they have a pathway to leadership um, and support their professional development within the organization so that leadership can truly reflect those that are served by the transportation industry. Thank you. Ms. M Ms. Smith, I, I was really excited to read your testimony which showed that more than 300 new trainees will be enrolled in North Carolina's on-the-job training programs this year. From your perspective, what makes North Carolina's on-the-job training program so successful? Ms. Smith? Question. Okay, uh, thank you for that question. Um, uh, Chair Norton, I, I believe that North Carolina is very successful in our OJT program and in increasing our trainees uh, because we have the full support of leadership from our governor to our secretary and our also our highway administration here in North Carolina at our regional offices. We really put a lot of effort into building collaborations, coalitions, and partnerships, uh, not only with our local stakeholders in our region, our trade associations, but also with our universities, our HBCUs, and our workforce development councils here locally. We've also revamped our programs to include the uh, building apprenticeship programs that we have not seen before. One of the newest initiatives that we have is a revamp program we call it our Reboot uh, Pop-Up Academy. So looking at individuals that have been historically uh, underemployed or unemployed and going back to the market to bring them back through a boot camp to do a skills refresh on soft skills and also offer them supportive services. We've also tapped into our incarcerated individuals, our women's prisons and also our Native American tribes. So typically uh, communities that have not been used as a resource for recruitment, we've really put a lot of effort into looking at all communities to see how we can grow communities. Um, it impacts us for our workforce and also the economy of North Carolina. Uh, thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, Ms. Smith, uh, Ms. Smith, that's been very helpful. I now recognize Mr. Crawford for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you all for being here today. Um, Ms. Carson, I want to direct a, a comment and a question to you. I, we're all familiar with the runaway inflation that we're experiencing today. Extreme gas prices are one example, food prices on the rise, um, and continued um, supply chain issues. Everything just seems to require more time and money. Can you talk about how this is affecting the construction industry and how you expect it to impact the ability to implement the projects funded by IJA? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you actually said it's time and money because really uh, 
we are, we are seeing a lot of um, flexibility on time as we work with our DOTs, but the reality is, is that we, in order to be able to do the work that we do, we have to follow a schedule, and we have to have a schedule of multiple projects, especially for a small contractor. I probably run about 50 projects a year, varying in sizes from, say, say $20,000 to to twenty thousand dollars, twenty million dollars. Um, so those types of projects, you need to be able to schedule those out. And so when we're seeing, not only we, are we seeing the cost increases on there, we're also seeing delays on projects because we can't get concrete pipe in time to do the underground work, which has to be done before we can do the do the uh, final grading work before we can pave a project. So really, these are just continuous delays. Those delays not only cost us money in terms of the material itself, but they are costing us money in terms of being able to get those projects out. And then it really just moves that snowball down the road. Mm -hmm. So in reality, we end up moving projects from this season into next season, um, and it ends up impacting our ability to get this work done. Um, <clears throat> another, I'm gonna stay with you on this topic here. Federally assisted construction projects like those funded by IGA, have to meet federal requirements like Davis-Bacon, for example, and the Service Contract Act. And while those regulations may have made sense historically, they were never indexed to inflation and, and they're severely outdated today and they create incredible time lags, financial burdens on federally funded projects. Just this week, for example, I heard from the Corps of Engineers um, that a simple tire repair on an all-terrain crane that should cost about $3,000 to repair, but it, it was more than double that expense, nearly $7,000 due to federal reg regulations. In your experience, what kinds of additional costs has the industry experienced due to outdated regulations like these? Really, it's a lot of administrative costs and project costs. Additional project costs added to the top that really add no value to the project itself. That's really where we see those types of costs happening. That um, it is extra implementation in terms of office staff to make sure we're meeting all of those requirements. It's extra project management out in the field to make sure that we are doing everything according to, according to the regulations. Now, don't get me wrong, we want to do things according to the regulations, and we pride ourselves on doing that. We want to pro pro provide a quality product to our end customer um, in a timely manner and provide good jobs for our employees, and we, we do that. In the alternative, what suggestions would you have for something like this uh, to be able to streamline and expedite projects? Um, to be able to streamline and expedite projects, you know, I would provide as much flexibility as you can to state and local governments to be able to know what needs to be done in their particular areas um, and not have it be, um, be handed down to them and rules and regulations that may not make sense in their particular jurisdiction. Gotcha. Appreciate you being here today. I'm going to yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman for yielding back. Um, I now recognize Ms. Johnson for five minutes. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman uh, and Ranking Member Davis for holding this hearing today. I would also like to thank our outstanding witnesses for testifying before us today. And before I proceed, I'd like to associate myself to your remarks for in reference to Mr. Young a former chair of the committee and someone that I've worked with on this committee for almost 30 years. Um, so I had, thank you. I had constituents in my district uh, asking me about the contracts and which will, when will they be available for infrastructure projects before the bill was even signed into law. And so like many people, I fully expected this legislation would create thousands of good paying and long-term jobs. Uh, the Democrats on this committee passed the largest transportation bill in history with $550 billion in critical infrastructure funding. This is a huge financial windfall for the construction industry, and it's only fair to ask our contractors who benefit the most from this funding to simply hire people in the community, pay a living wage, and offer training to those employees. I am pleased to hear the testimony from some of the many people who are benefiting from the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and look forward to hearing from my witnesses even more. 
I, I'm from a large state with lots of projects needed and a lot of people with jobs. I'm sorry that I don't see someone from Texas talking about our progress and what we're doing to enable more people to have opportunities. So what I'd like to do is ask first Ms. Tanya Smith, Director of the Office of Civil Rights in North Carolina. Uh, you understand how hard it is for small and minority businesses to succeed. So it's unfortunate that many states don't make any effort to institute or enforce DBE goals. Do you think that states, DOTs, and, and people in your position have enough strong enforcement mechanisms to ensure businesses are meeting DBE requirements on projects? And can you discuss your experience with that and what additional tools Congress can provide? Thank you for asking that question, Representative uh, Johnson. And I'm glad to be able to respond to you accordingly. That's a critical question that we discuss a lot in all civil rights programs and state DOTs is how to really enforce and enhance our goal setting programs. One of the major obstacles that we see state to state is a lack of DBE goals on professional services contracts. It's something that is done on a state level. The federal regulations allow us to do it. However, many states just do not have the goals based on state statutes on those professional services contracts. That's one of the strongest things I believe you can do today is to have that goal setting program. Um, but to answer your question, we could use and benefit from greater enforcement um, at the federal level to ensure that um, all of our procurement obstacles are mitigated as best as possible. Another major thing that could really assist the state DOTs is having a more enhanced and robust data collection system, one that pulls all the information from state DOTs that we can pull from. Oftentimes I'm asked, what are other states doing and how could we do it better? Um, have they been successful? That's a story that we continue to ask. We do peer-to-peer -peer exchanges, but there really is no central repository that's collecting all this information. Um, furthermore, I believe that we can enhance our research and development efforts with the HBCUs to really target the economic impact and also the obstacles that we face with firms being utilized on contracts. It's a much greater issue we cannot always understand as times change. Uh, we have different financial struggles and financial capacity issues that we have to help businesses mitigate. These are just a few things that the uh, Congress can do to help us to reach our goals to help these small minority businesses. Well, thank you very much. My time is about out, but Madam Chair, I'd like to submit two questions to the committee for persons to answer later. Uh, to Ms. Carrie Karst and Ms. Kelly Coupet. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, and we will be glad to receive them. Uh, Mr. Perry, you'll recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ms. Karst, good afternoon. It's good to see you. Good to see another contractor putting people to work and doing great things in America. And your testimony highlighted AGC's opposition to government-mandated project labor agreements and concerns that they would likely exacerbate workforce challenges. Um, and specific, I think they raised the concerns that mandated PLAs act as a barrier for hiring small businesses, including WBE and MBE, and the fulfillment of small business utilization goals. Can you, can you expand uh, on how, your thoughts on PLA and how they create barriers to hiring of small business and DBEs? So, you know, I'm from a small state work on small projects, uh, project labor, labor agreements are completely foreign to anything that we would do in the state of South Dakota or the state of Nebraska where I work. Um, what we essentially have no union, no effective union presence in our state. Um, we take care of our employees. We do a good job of taking care of our employees. And so the opportunities for me um, would change dramatically and Although I'm a small contractor in the whole realm of things, in terms of AGC members, you know, our members' average size, I believe, is about, have about nine employees. I have 150 employees. So for firms of that size to be able to participate effectively in, in projects that have those types of agreements um, is very detrimental or very difficult for them to do. DOT projects, 
um, have enough regulations on them as, as they go that it becomes difficult to, for smaller contractors to participate on that, but we figured that out on how to do that. Um, moving this, PLAs, in my opinion, move a whole nother level um, of complexity to the process that, again, exclude um, smaller contractors for large contractors. But having been a small contractor myself, I would agree with you. In your testimony, you also state recently the FHWA released a guidance memo highlighting that states should focus exclusively on maintenance and repair work on existing roadways before building uh, new capacity. You're correctly pointing out that this policy was rejected by Congress's, Congress and IAJA negotiations and paints a false narrative based on FHWA's own data, which states that 80% of roadway construction projects already repair existing roads and bridges. Unfortunately, the FHWA is trying to impose the chairman's failed priorities by executive fiat, almost word for word, if you want to know. This is a completely unacceptable subversion of congressional intent and the law must, that must be uh, rejected. Congress rejected the policy because it misallocates resources and restricts localities and states from making planning decisions to meet their own needs. Can you expand at all upon the negative economic effect on the roadway construction industry, particularly small businesses like yourself and DBE construction firms that will occur if FHWA continues to pursue what I consider per perverse um, perversion of the congressional intent? Really, it comes down to opportunity. Um, and really, again, providing states flexibility to do what's right for them. As you said, 80% of the work is already in repair and maintenance. In my state, I believe the number is more like 91% of the work is already repair and maintenance. So it becomes unnecessary to even have the guidance and a little bit confusing in the sense that there are projects. There are projects in small communities and larger communities that I work in that are necessary for expansion because we do have growth going on. Um, and when we have growth going on, we, we have the land in the area to expand. And so we being restricted to do those things by even a guidance um, makes projects more difficult. I'm glad Washington's here to help you. Finally, uh, PLAs are not the only labor provision that tilt contracts in favor of closed shop entities at the expense of open shop minority and women-owned businesses and small businesses. Unfortunately, the DB prevailing wages also stand in the way of greater small business and DBE participation. Do you think that some reforms are necessary, I guess, is, uh, uh, to ensure federal building or federal funding is spent efficiently and the, uh, the DOT needs are met? Do you think some reforms are necessary? Yes, I think that the Davis-Bacon um, needs to be updated. It needs to be um, broadened to include open shop and union opportunities to give states the opportunity to update their, um, their particular wage scales um, more frequently and as needed. Um, to be honest with you, um, Davis-Bacon in South Dakota is way below what anybody pays. But the, but, the, but the rates that are in Davis-Bacon, we can't get them to come up. We can't get them to come up because there's not effective ways for a essentially non-union state to be able to affect those, those scales. So it needs updating, um, and we need to have the flexibility to do what we need to do in our state. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield the balance. Thank you. Uh, I now recognize Ms. Brownlee for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Ms. Uh, Kupkik, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing your name uh, correctly. I have a feeling I'm probably not. But I, first, I want to thank you very, very much for your advocacy for women. Um, I, you're passionate about it, and I appreciate it very much. I was interested... Uh, in your testimony where you stated between February of 2020 and July 2021, more women entered uh, the construction workforce than ever before with an increase of 3.2%. Actually, you say the largest increase of any industry during that time. Um, and during the same time frame, uh, time frame uh, men's participation in the construction in industry actually decreased by 4%. So 
Um, you know, the time period that you're referencing is certainly around the height of COVID. I am, I'm just very curious to know what drove more women uh, into the workforce uh, during this time frame. Thank you, Representative Romney, for your comments and your kind words. Um, yeah, that was actually an AGC Autodesk report that we referenced in our comments and written testimony. And what we have found, and also looking at a report from the Institute for Women's Policy Research, you know, certainly many, many women were disproportionately impacted by uh, the pandemic for reasons to need to take to stay home, to leave the workforce to care for family members who were either sick or children who were not able to be in school or have childcare. But we also saw many, many women reaching out to us and other tradeswomen organizations and free apprenticeship programs across the country saying, you know, I've had this opportunity to reflect and I need to do something different to care for myself and my family, to have an economic security for my future and for my family. And I believe that also um, one of the challenges that we had during the pandemic of providing care, especially at the, uh, or training, especially at the beginning and shifting to offering a hybrid, hybrid uh, model of remote training and in-person training, we reached more women. We reached more women in rural communities and other areas where they didn't necessarily have a, a vocational school nearby or a community college or community-based program such as ours. So we saw more women coming in and we wanna continue that trend and we wanna make sure that the women that come in stay in. I hope that answers your question. Yes, it does. Thank you very much. You also, in your testimony, uh, you noted that uh, women, and particularly women of color, face discrimination uh, in hiring and long-term employment. And, um, and amongst uh, your recommendations was uh, a requirement for contractors to do more to ensure uh, respectful uh, workplaces, work sites. Um, do you have a kind of a ballpark estimate on how many contractors currently require employees to receive workplace training on diversity and inclusiveness, uh, including education related to ending sexual harassment on the job? Thank you so much for that question. And certainly there are already federal guidelines in place around affirmative action and equal employment opportunity and anti-harassment. I wish I had a number for you and I wish I could say it's more than a handful that we have here in Portland who've committed to uh, not just stating on paper that they um, have policies about harassment, but actually are implementing a strong and rigorous and engaging and proactive programs such as uh, Green Dot or Rise Up or other programs that are intentional for our construction sector to mitigate harassment, hazing and bullying, which are a huge cost to employers, right? And so um, we are lucky here in the Pacific Northwest, Oregon Tradeswomen runs a program called Rise Up, Respect, Inclusion, Safety and Equity that was developed by our sister organization, Anew in Seattle in partnership with the building trades and other industry partners. And we are seeing that that is making a difference in the, in the workforce being retained. And in particular women, women of color and people of color, but we have so much more work to do in this space. They thank you for your question. It's an Great, important and I have one last very quick question. So I've spent a lot of my time in Congress advocating for our nation's veterans, particularly our women veterans. Um, and I'm just wondering if you have a way in which to reach out to women veterans in your community. We absolutely do. We work with our state veterans affairs department. Um, we have a lot of advocacy underway here in Oregon uh, with our state apprenticeship and training council. In fact, our executive administrator uh, formerly worked for Helmets for Hard Hats, uh, Director Lisa Ransom. So there's a lot of intentionality and it's an incredible opportunity for returning vets to get into these careers and particularly for women who have had those similar skills uh, while serving our, our nation. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, I recognize uh, Mr. Babin for five minutes.
Testing better. Okay, sorry. I hope they don't penalize me for that for that lost time. Now, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I thank the witnesses for being here. And uh, I, I'd like to direct this question uh, and statement to uh, Ms. Karst. Thank you so much uh, for your expertise. As noted in your testimony, a historic level of funding was injected into the transportation and infrastructure sector with the passage of the Inf uh, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, or IIJA. However, we all know that simply throwing money at a problem doesn't always actually solve that problem. Throwing billions of taxpayer dollars at this industry without solving the supply chain crisis, pandemic recovery issues like fraud and abuse, major workforce shortages, overly burdensome bureaucratic red tape, and other underlying issues will not actually allow us to see long-term sustainable improvement and investment in our nation's infrastructure. I represent a district in Southeast Texas, uh, near the Houston area, nine counties, with more oil refineries uh, in it than anywhere else in the country. I understand how dire the need for a skilled workforce is. However, as you mentioned in your testimony, and I thank you for that testimony, uh, when the Biden administration decided to prioritize projects based on labor preferences, they missed the mark. Uh, although who is surprised that they put politics over people? The administration knew full well that they were risking companies' abilities to recruit and maintain a talented and capable workforce with their union dictated executive orders. But like you said, they took something that really needed to be addressed at the very root of that problem and put a liberal band-aid over it and waited for the applause from people who have no idea what they're talking about. At a conference last month, Senator Chuck Schumer, Majority Leader of the Senate, stated in his role as Majority Leader of the Senate, he will fight to ensure that, quote, every blanking federal dollar only pays for union labor further emphasizing his support for PLAs everywhere. Mind you, there was explicit language in his original quote that I won't be repeating. Uh, I try not to talk like that down in uh, where I'm from. Uh, but for everyone's awareness, IIJA says nothing about project labor agreements and definitely nothing about every dollar only paying for union labor. These comments are pretty concerning, especially to the 87.4% of non-union workers in that construction arena. I have a letter here from more than 1,000 construction companies and another letter from nearly 20 business groups that all oppose Biden's PLA mandate. They say that PLAs discriminate against firms and workers based on whether or not their workers are union. Uh, so if we could enter those into the record, I would appreciate it. Uh, can you please explain, Mrs. Karst, how uh, government-mandated PLAs are hurting your industry? Again, as I said before, I have no experience on a PLA. I have read about PLAs. I have, can rely on the, um, the knowledge of my fellow contractors in AGC. And the reality is, is that what, what I do as a contractor and what the 87% that you just talked about do, is we provide good jobs for our employees. We pay our employees well. We pay our employees great benefits, in some cases better, better benefits that are in, than are the unions. If our employees were forced to go on a project labor agreement, one of the things that could happen in our area where there really is no union representation is they would be forced to pay union dues for union benefits that they would never be able to um, take a part of. So as far as we're, you know, I have a, I have a saying in our company, we re, the people come first. And I really believe that as in order to have a good business, I have to treat my people well. I can't survive without treating my people well. And I don't need the government to tell me how to do that. I know instinctively how to take care of my employees. And I, if I didn't, I would not have the 150 employees that, that um, Congressman Johnson talked to me about. And so what I am advocating for is letting us run our businesses the way it's best for the area that we live in. Absolutely, I could not agree more. And I don't have any further follow-up questions, so I will yield that back. Thank you, Ms. Carson, appreciate it. Mr. Garcia is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and uh, Chair DeFazio for holding this hearing on workforce development uh, and job creation in the surface transportation industry. 
This issue is very close to my heart and very important to my district, which is a heavily Latino district in Chicago that has a lot of transportation, construction, and contracting businesses. The Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act authorizes $1.2 trillion to invest in our infrastructure, including $660 billion for the U.S. Department of Transportation. This level of investment is historic, but we ensure the benefits of this funding flows from states, transit agencies, and prime contractors to Black and Latino businesses and workers. For too long, minority businesses, especially Black and Latino businesses, have not received an adequate portion of contracts in the transportation, construction, and contracting industries. That discrimination only shatters the hopes and dreams of many business owners and workers, but ends up leading to disinvestments in these same Latino and Black communities. Uh, there are some really important programs in the IIJA that will help make meaningful progress in giving current and future Black and Latino transportation businesses and workers opportunities for success, including the U.S. Uh, Department of Transportation's uh, Disadvantaged Business Enterprise or DBE program, but we got to do more. Next week, I will introduce comprehensive legislation to improve and strengthen the U.S. Department of Transportation's Disadvantaged Business Enterprise program and the Small Business Administration's 8A Business Development Program. This legislation will strengthen these programs by increasing the personal net worth caps to account for inflation, conforming to the U.S. Department of Transportation's uh, DBE size standard with the Small Business Administration standards and create universal recognition of DBE certifications. That means that DBE certifications will now be recognized across the states instead of the current patchwork system. I look forward to working with members of this committee and stakeholders on my legislation addressing these uh, issues. A question for uh, Ms. Rye. In your testimony, you highlight some of these issues uh, you'd like to see addressed in the DBE program, like the personal net worth uh, cap or the DOT size standards that my legislation would propose addressing. In your opinion, do you believe this committee should advance and mark up legislation that would accomplish those goals? Thank you so much, Representative Garcia, and for your leadership uh, in this effort. Um, yes, Compto would like to see um, closer oversight by DBE officers to avoid fraudulent front companies um, through more vigorous training programs for certification and compliance officers and a stronger and clearer definition of good faith efforts with fewer waivers from DBE goals granted to majority owned firms. Um, in addition, you spoke about um, DBE size standards. We do support action that would conform the USDOT's DBE size standard with the Small Business Administration standards. We believe it's a simple fix to a big problem. Um, in the interest of fairness and consistency and the survival of small minority-owned businesses, we believe that the USDOT should use the Federal Aviation Administration's model and use SBA size standards when making determinations with regard to small business status. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, Ms. Kupchak, uh, do you agree that this committee and the U.S. Department of Transportation should work on legislative and regulatory fixes to these issues, including the ones you raised in your testimony? Representative Garcia, thank you so much uh, for your question uh, and for your comments. Yes, I do believe that uh, the committee and Congress have an opportunity to, without burdening or adding uh, significant administrative burdens, to employers enact policy and strategies that we have seen that have demonstrated on, uh, you know, in the real world outcomes that are not just good for business, but are good for workers. And, and I would like to commend Ms. Karst as president of VX Civil and Construction that she's committed to the workers that she employs. But I would also say that not every employer believes in or does the right thing. And so making sure that public investments our high road for workers and for businesses, including DBEs. It is, that is a critical uh, moment for us to shift uh, historic marginalization of those entities and ensure that all Americans working on publicly funded projects have access to economic security and dignity in their work. 
I hope Thank that you answers so your question. Thank you. Thank you. I yield back, Madam Chair. Mr. Lamoff is, or is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Um, appreciate the uh, opportunity here. Um, let me ask Ms. Karst about um, with the, uh, I don't know how much has been covered today, but it, with uh, the local hire issue, okay, um, it means a great deal to uh, people in, in the districts, especially, you know, we have disaster issues that happen on certain, um, certain jobs that post disaster, it'd be very helpful to have local input and local uh, work on that and construction projects, all, all matter of things. And government sometimes claims, hey, it's going to make an effort to uh, uh, strengthen and utilize local hire. But um, what's what's your take on these uh, preferences, these uh, emphasis on local hire? What's that really mean for, as far as uh, um, the, the work of getting the contracting done, getting the, uh, the, the contractors being able to do their job and using our own core versus as much as possible of a local hire? Um, again, I'm going to fall back to the same word, flexibility. The reality is, is that um, my employees are local employees um, that have jobs with me. My jobs aren't always local. And so I may have to displace my workers if I'm at, on a job that's somewhere else. And in reality, I'll just give you a, a quick real example. Um, the unemployment in South Dakota in my area is about 2.6%. My biggest project is three hours away in Norfolk, Nebraska. The unemployment is about 2.1%. There are no workers for me to hire locally there. We are trying to because we need workers, so we would hire locally. We have a huge advertising campaign to go there. But I think what we need to do is provide the flexibility to do what makes a construction project. What's your experience free. with the flexibility on saying, hey, we've... Uh there is low unemployment there is there some kind of factor that kicks in some kind of uh, trigger or what have you that would say um, local goals are being met we don't need to do that and still fulfill the spirit of it do you find that that's being written in any of these at least we need that flexibility you, you need it but do you find that that occurs currently whether it might be I, you know, so Such this provisions. is the example that I have of local hire is I work also, we have quite a few reservations in South Dakota, and so there are local hire type um, arrangements with the tribes, and we do hire people locally, and those are usually based on quotas, and what we find, it works fine as long as, as, long as it is a percentage of the, uh, my crew that I can keep my crew safe while they're out there working. So for example, if I'm gonna bring a crew of 20 people out there, I can't have 20 new people out there because I can't assure the safety and the work and the, uh, the safeness of the work that needs to happen out there. So as long as I have the flexibility to supplement my existing forces who I can know where it's trained and know how to do the work, I can deal with the local hire. But the other thing that I will tell you that there's a little bit of a fallacy about the local hire from my experience is, will they stay with us? Will they stay in the industry? And that, that is what we have found in 30 years of working on the reservations. We go out there, we, we provide good jobs, we find good employees. We find some good employees and we want them to stay with us and, and to find careers in our, in our industry and we haven't had very much luck with that. Mm, okay. So do you find that might make certain contractors avoid uh, bidding on certain projects if they find that those constraints seem too, uh, too narrow? Absolutely, there's people that won't bid on jobs because of that. Mm -hmm. Okay. What do you find uh, a lot of discussion in committee here today about uh, supply not just to uh, local hires, but we're hearing a lot about minority hire and gender hire, or even some cases disability hire, disabled veterans and such, and so each certain, depending on the project, they have to have a percentage of all those things in a project. And what I hear about anecdotally at, at home is that like, well, they have to go out and find somebody and even in some cases make up a shell corporation fitting one of these, a shell company, a shell contractor, subcontractor to get this done. How much, uh, how much problem do you find it is trying to fulfill some of these numbers in some cases? You know, I can't tell you that I have a lot of experience working on contracts that have given me certain numbers. I can tell you that what, what we do is we need every employee we can get. Mm -hmm. As a female in the industry who started 30 years ago, um, the, the cause of trying to find female 
um, trades workers is huge. I mean, the numbers that the chairman talked about being 10% of women in the industry really become much less when you start getting to the trades. When you start getting to, to skilled trades in the construction industry, the numbers that I see are more like three or four. So where, where's the fault in that? Is it the contractor? Is it is it somewhere in the education process? I mean, if you're trying to force feed in there and you don't have the people that are up for it, what, where's the fix? I think what AGC would advocate for is, is more funding to CTE programs and forcing those types of programs to, um, to the try to attract expired. emails, that kind of thing. So. Thank you. I use my I recognize myself for five minutes. Ms. Smith, your testimony highlights a key issue. Not only are women and minorities underrepresented in the construction workforce at large, but when you consider industry positions ranked official and supervisor, there's an even greater disparity. How can Congress support state efforts to move women and minorities into higher ranking positions within the industry? Thank you for that question, um, Representative, and I would like to address that. One of the challenges first I want to mention is how uh, women and minorities, especially women who are minorities, are identified at the federal level. I think that needs addressing, um, that usually you have non-minority versus minority and then gender. So I do think that supporting programs designated for women of color in particular would be very very beneficial to um, the entire industry. Um, how do we get uh, women uh, and minorities to a higher level? Because they are underrepresented. One of the things that our agency is doing is looking at creating partnership and collaborations with non-traditional partners, uh, working with collaboration agreements with our community colleges, with our university system, our HBCUs, but also create incubator type programs to really enhance the transportation industry, working with our local companies who need these skilled laborers to help train the workforce. Something that's innovative that North Carolina did was actually our, our internal state agency began to work with our OJT program itself to train individuals for recruitment back to the agency and also back into the industry. Those are just one of many things that we can do to support the upskilling of these workers. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Ms. Kupchak, how have barriers to career advancement in the construction industry impacted trades women and, under, and other underrepresented groups? Thank you, Representative, for your uh, question. It's an important one. Uh, certainly, you know, getting into the construction trades is important, and I believe that does begin with career education early on, even into the middle school and high school, and uh, myself and my colleagues across the country who run community organizations uh, such as Oregon Tradeswomen's, we do a lot of that work. But uh, another barrier is the, is the industry's continued uh, sort of macho attitude and toxic job site culture that drives good tradeswomen uh, and people of color to, to leave the industry when those kinds of behaviors are allowed to become part of our workplace. And the efforts underway um, and referenced in the memorandum of agreement between the US Department of Transportation and Department of Labor earlier this year, uh, referencing uh, the, the need for additional equity measures and anti-harassment uh, measures is certainly key in retaining qualified, skilled, and diverse workers. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Under competitive bidding laws, federally assisted construction contracts are generally required to be awarded to the lowest cost bidder. Prevailing wage requirements ensure that federally assistant projects are not awarded to unscrupulous contractors who underbid the, com the competition with low wages or poor benefits for workers. Mr. Booker, can you discuss the impact to construction workers if prevailing wage, wage requirements are not in place? And do prevailing wage requirements only benefit union members? Prevailing wage requirements benefit all workers. Uh, and, and in the communities where uh, the wages are higher, it lifts the wages for whether or not you're a union worker or not a union worker. Um, that's what the governing, what the, what the, what the mark is. Um, and, and like Kari testified earlier, the, the wage rates, the prevailing wage in, in, in her home state are, are far below of what's, what's going on out there and, and what people are being paid. So uh, the prevailing wage boosts the economy. It boosts the worker. Uh, we're talking, you know, how, how, do you, how do you fight inflation? How do you do that? Cutting wages is not the way to do that. Um, making sure that people have a, a job, a job with dignity, a job with a health care benefit, a job with a pension. That's how, you, that's how you counter these things. And making sure that you, you value and you treasure the people who are applying their skills day in and day out. That's who we represent, and that's what we do day in and day out. 
Thank you. Director Liu, as you know, the IIJA provided new authority for states and cities to implement contra contracting requirements that address local needs on federally assistant infrastructure projects. Why is it necessary for states and cities to have these types of flexibilities in setting the terms of their construction contracts? Um, th thanks for the question. And you know, I think looking at the issue I addressed in my testimony, you know, it's really important that when we think about building infrastructure projects, we think about those as fitting into a context as part of a community, right? We all talk about infrastructure spending in terms of big numbers and big job numbers. You know, what that means is that every dollar we put in supports somebody's employment. And if we're trying to make sure that there's equity in the way that that's distributed, you know, having these mechanisms to sort of put the jobs in the places that are also bearing the impact of the projects is really important. I think Unfortunately, also, Director Lou, my time has expired, but I would oh, love sorry. to get this full answer so that we can have it on the record. A absolutely. Happy to submit a longer answer for the record. Thank you so much. Mr. Fitzpatrick is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, Mr. Booker, uh, good to see you, sir. Thanks for, uh, for joining us today. Um, in your opening statement, you had mentioned uh, registered apprenticeship programs. Um, I, uh, along with many of our uh, huge supporters of the building trades, uh, I'm a big believer uh, in these programs and I believe they can help us uh, have that skilled workforce that we need to be competitive in the future. Uh, and it's critical that the next generation of workers be as specialized as the current ones. Um, you mentioned that uh, your registered apprenticeship programs offer a debt-free career path. Uh, so I have really a three-part question. Uh, could you tell us first, could you tell us what, uh, what costs are covered and which costs aren't? Um, second, are apprentices themselves responsible for any costs associated with the program? And then lastly, um, do you receive any federal money uh, for your registered programs? Thank you for the question, Congressman Fitzpatrick, uh, and thank you for your support uh, on, uh, on, on these previous issues. So to answer your question, if I get them right, on, on debt-free, I did testify earlier that registered apprenticeship is debt-free. Our system uh, allows for an apprentice to go to school while he works. It's an earn-as-you-learn program. Um, so as you uh, enter the program, you're getting classroom training uh, nights and on weekends. You're getting your hours to graduate through the apprenticeship program. That is no out-of-pocket cost for you. You're actually getting paid uh, at, a, at a scaled rate, you know, based on what the prevailing rate is, what the collectively bargained rate is, uh, and you are not paying any money out-of-pocket. As far as the individual cost to the apprentice, there is no schooling cost. The, you, know, you, you may have to pay uh, transportation costs. You may have to pay uh, you know, if there's requirements for the job you're at for a particular type of uh, clothing or, or not, you know, PPE that uh, isn't covered by the employer. There's some potential from out-of-pocket costs there. But uh, as far as the schooling and the education, there is no cost um, for that. And when it comes to federal assistance, we don't have any. Uh, we have negotiated through our collective bargaining agreements um, for decades. Uh, a system in which our members partnered with our contractors, and rather than put those wages on their check, they have deferred those monies or they've put those monies uh, into these training contributions. And those training contributions have added up, as I testified, to over $2 billion annually that we spend on training. Um, so the individual apprentice doesn't spend any money. The federal government doesn't spend any money. That is a relationship, a collective bargaining relationship that we as the unions work with collectively with uh, our contractor partners to put training as a priority to make sure that we have the world's best, safest, and skilled workforce. Thank you, Mr. Booker, for answering that on the record, um, because we want that on the record as we are pushing hard to advance apprenticeship programs. Uh, it, it is critical to rebuilding the nuts and bolts in America, uh, particularly following on the heels of uh, the bipartisan infrastructure uh, bill. And um, there's no better way to deal with our labor and workforce shortages than invest heavily in these apprenticeship programs. Madam Chair, I yield back. Ms. Still is now recognized for five minutes. Mr. Stauber is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you all for being here today. Uh, you know, whenever we talk about uh, investments in our infrastructure, we should be talking about the real infrastructure that ordinary Americans rely on, roads, bridges, broadband, ports, airports, and the like. These same infrastructure investments are the very ones that employ my neighbors and our hardworking union men and women. 
almost every day I hear from employers and unions back home about their desperate need for a skilled workforce. Without a properly trained and prepared workforce pipeline, our trades industry will continue to see a reduction of qualified talent for decades to come. This is why I am very proud of the fact that I was able to join several colleagues and introduce and pass through the House, the National Apprenticeship Act on a bipartisan basis. I'm eager to see that bill pass the Senate and get signed into law so we can keep staffing up our halls and get labor organized on our projects. I was also proud to have introduced an amendment in the Natural Resources Committee to strengthen and support PLAs which enjoyed unanimous support from Republicans. Mr. Booker, can you please speak a little bit about the importance of registered apprenticeships to the workforce pipeline and future infrastructure projects? and investments. Yes, uh, thank you for the question. And you know, registered apprenticeship is the foundation of our unions. And it's quite frankly the foundation of our country. Uh, when you talk about the investment that we're gonna have in the next 10 years and, and the acts of this Congress to uh, put real money behind this, uh, you've gotta have that workforce, you gotta have that workforce in order to do that. Uh, we believe and we know that our system uh, is unlike no other. And, and the training that we do, whether it's a three, four, five year program, to give the people the skill sets you know, to apply those skill sets as they are building the nation's infrastructure so that at the, upon completion uh, of their apprenticeship, three, four, five years of completion, they're a journeyman, they're a journey person. They're able to apply those skills for the rest of their life and be firmly entrenched in the middle class. And, uh, and the apprenticeship program, we talked about cost, uh, which uh, is little to none, but the experience you get uh, is uh, second to none. Um, can you also please speak about how permitting delays and frivolous lawsuits kill skilled jobs and prevent good union men and women from getting the job done on time and on budget? Yes, and, and the, the permitting in this country has gotten uh, to the point where, you know, it, we've lost predictability. And, and anybody, whether you're a contractor, an owner, developer, craft worker, uh, you want to know what happens on Monday. You want to know, you know, you're going to be able to go to work, you're going to be able to, you know, perform your craft, you're going to be able to get paid. If you don't have the, uh, the permits in place, and if you're going through this arduous process, it's lengthening the process to get the actual project built. And as we've talked about materials and, and cost of how that they have uh, increased over the years, if you're expecting to build a project starting in 2018 and four years later, you still haven't built that project, the material costs alone have increased. So it's creating a, a backlog of, of problems and it's creating a problem. And again, it's not just a, a union versus non-union problem. Any project that's not permitted is creating people or preventing people from going to work. Right. Um, can we talk briefly about the NEPA process? Uh, are you um, in, encouraging a change in the NEPA process? And I'll give you an example. Uh, we have a, uh, a mine in northern, uh, northern Minnesota uh, that's been in its 19th year of permitting that had a PLA or what have you, and uh, through frivolous lawsuits, et cetera. Um, are you working to um, uh, support a change uh, in the NEPA regulations and laws to reduce the redundancy uh, and the frivolous lawsuits? We, we've supported previous legislation uh, in, in this body and, and at the Senate where you're looking to streamline the process. I believe in a permitting process. I believe that you have to go through uh, the process to make sure, but you shouldn't have to go through the same process six times to get the same project the permit that it needs. So if we have the ability to have federal agencies, state agencies, local agencies look at the same time for what is needed, so then once you have that decision is made, you have a window, lawsuits are done, cleared and out the way, then we're able to go to work. So we're, we're, we're supportive of that. The certainty is, uh, is really important. And I will say you, you brought up a, ti uh, a timely projects. Um, in Northern Minnesota, we don't have a 12 month season. Uh, we have uh, eight, nine, and sometimes uh, if we were lucky to get 10 months in. And so these, these, uh, the NEPA changes and these uh, policies need to be changed to allow those uh, folks in the northern states to be able to get these projects done because sometimes just a frivolous lawsuit or a delay will take a whole nother year and a whole nother construction year which is, going, which is going to delay the project even more so. I appreciate all the comments here and, uh, and uh, I just appreciate uh, uh, having you answer these questions. Thank you and uh, Madam Chair, I yield back. Ms. Still is recognized for five minutes. That concludes our hearing.
I would like to thank each of the witnesses for your testimony today. Your comments have been informative and very helpful, especially for me. I ask unanimous consent that the record of today's hearing remain open until such time as our witnesses have provided answers to any questions that may be submitted to them in writing. I also ask unanimous consent that the record remain open for 15 days for any additional comments and information submitted by members or witnesses to be included in the record of today's hearing. Without objection? Object. So ordered. The subcommittee stands adjourned.